Okay, thank you for joining us today for this Page Society Edelman Japan joint seminar. Before we start, uh, this seminar will be held in English, uh, but for those of you who wish to listen to the seminar in Japanese, simultaneous translation is available by choosing Japanese in the interpretation function at the bottom right of your screen. My name is Dan Lockman. I'm a chair of Page Society's Japan chapter and also managing director of group communications at Oryx. Most of you will be familiar with Edelman, but maybe not PAGE. A PAGE is the world's foremost association for communications leaders. It has a membership of the senior communicators or CCOs of the world's major multinational companies, as well as leaders of large agencies, including Edelman, of course, and key academics in the communication space. Here in Japan, we have a small but active chapter consisting of global communications leaders at Lixil, uh, like Jin here today, uh, Nissan, Hitachi, Rakuten, Takeda, Kirin, and Oryx. We're always looking for more members who are passionate about driving forward the communications profession in Japan to join. So if you want to hear more about Paige and even apply to join, please contact me at the email address in the chat now. In today's seminar, we'll be discussing the future of Brand Japan as the world continues to change at a rapid pace after both the pandemic and the Olympics. This is obviously a very broad topic, but through the Edelman data that Megan will present to you in a moment, it is clear that companies are becoming more and more expected to take a larger role, both internally in terms of engaging with their employees on issues that matter to them, and also externally in addressing social issues and ensuring that their brands are in line with the expectations not only of their shareholders but broader stakeholders as a whole. To look deeper into these areas, Megan Barstow, President of Edelman Japan, will first take us through the findings of recent Edelman research. Due to time restrictions, she will only introduce the main data points, but the full reports are available on the edelman.jp website. After that, Megan will moderate a panel of three experts who we are honored to have as our guests today to discuss some of the issues the research brings up. Let me briefly introduce them. Sakie, Sakie Tachibana Fukushima has deep experience both in academia and business, having taught at Harvard University before working as a consultant at Bain and & Company and then heading up Corn Ferry Japan and is now president and representative director at GNS Global Advisors. She was selected as the only Japanese in Business Week's list of the world's 100 most influential headhunters and has written numerous books and articles and given many speeches on human resources, career development and corporate governance. Thank you for joining us today. Jin Montesano is Executive Officer and Chief People Officer of Lixil. She is also a director on the Lixil Corporation Board. She is responsible for the company's transformation from a people and culture perspective. Thank you, Jin. Leo Lewis is Asia business editor, Financial Times, with a broad beat covering society, technology, corporate Japan, and the impact of the country's first governance code. I'm sure many of you will have read his insightful and often humorous articles covering a range of areas in Japan. Thank you to all three. For, for joining us today. With this, let me hand over to Megan to present the Edelman findings. If you wish to ask any questions, please post them in the Q&A box and we'll try to get as, to as many as we can. Megan, over to you. Thanks so much, Dan. Uh, let me pull up the slides. Great, um, thank you, Dan, for the introduction. Thank you so much to our panelists for sharing their insights and thoughts in the discussion to follow. And thanks to all of you for making time to attend. I know that your days are very busy. It's truly an honor to co-host this session with the Page Society. I was reflecting that in times when we've, so much has changed and have been working in a remote environment, having a community of like-minded uh, Fellows to discuss issues of the day is so important. So I do think it's a very valuable society for communicators. It's also an honor to share Edelman's trust barometer data and the implications that it has for both Japan and for companies operating outside of Japan as well. A few words on Edelman. Many of you do know us, hopefully, um, but 
We are the world's largest communications firm with a presence in 65 countries, 6,000 members. We're family owned. Uh, we have a full integrated uh, communication services, but I do think what we're most known for is what I'm presenting today, our deep research into trust, um, both what drives trust and counseling our clients on that. So without further ado, I'd like to dive into the slides today. So first I wanted to walk through just the broad context of our Edelman Trust Barometer. We've been studying and counseling clients on trust for 21 years. We started the Edelman Trust Barometer in 2001 following the World Trade protests in Seattle. We saw a seismic shift in the expectations of traditional institutions and so we began that survey. Throughout the 21 years, we've really been able to reflect major shifts in sentiment globally and in local regions. Also, the impact of global events on trust. And in some cases, we've even been able to predict some changes, or we like to believe that's the case. For example, in 2004, five and six, we started to see a very significant shift in the traditional um, hierarchy of trust from top down to side horizontal and a rise of trust in a person like me. In 2000 and 2009 and 2010, we saw a distinct, significant plummet of trust in business following the global banking crisis. Again, we saw another plummet in trust in government this time in 2012 and 13, following the Fukushima incident. In 2016 and 17, we started to see the rise of populism reflect, uh, resulting in the election of Donald Trump and Boris Johnson. We saw in our data that there was a rising gap between the educated elite and the mass population that we surveyed. And now in 2021, we're declaring information bankruptcy or what we call an infodemic. As we saw the impact of the pandemic, we've also seen a significant impact to the state of trust and traditional sources of information. So today we're gonna to walk through four surveys uh, that we have conducted this year. As the pandemic has accelerated, we've seen not only the pandemic, but global events, change of leadership, Black Lives Matter, um, other incidents that are really impacting trust and changing expectations rapidly. And so we have accelerated the pace of our surveys. Um, we'll walk through very, very briefly our two core, the findings of our two core surveys, which is the Edelman Trust Barometer. In January every year, we launched this cornerstone research. It's our largest survey, 28 countries, 33,000 respondents. And we look at the state of trust in the four major institutions of society, business, government, NGOs, and media. We look at trust in the informed elite and the general public. We followed on uh, with the January data with a, 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 another one in the spring. We sensed that expectations and sentiment was changing rapidly, so we wanted to check in on the state of trust. Based on the findings in the spring data, we then did two follow-on deep dive surveys, one into ex changing expectations of consumers as it relates to brands, and then the second into the expectations of employees as it relates to employers. Those are the two pieces of data that we're gonna focus on primarily today. So before we dive into that, I did want to just share the top findings from the, the two uh, trust barometer um, survey data in January and May to set the stage for what's to follow. Um, so first and foremost, a year, ago, a year and a half ago at the start of the pandemic, Globally, there was a little trust bump or bubble as we call it in the major institutions. We saw this uh, possibly because people were really looking for answers in a time that was so uncertain. So globally, there was this temporary bump, uh, but a year later in January, we saw that that bubble burst and trust really plummeted in all four institutions. Um, globally, business was the only institution remaining in trusted territory. In Japan, um, as usual, things are slightly different um, and often much more um, distrusting. So in a, a year and a half ago at the start of the pandemic, there was no trust bubble. Um, there was no little bump for government or elsewhere. And we've just seen a steady decline in trust. And so this January and then in May, we continue to see trust levels drop in Japan. And it's worth noting that no institution is trusted in Japan. They are all in distrusted territory, although I will say that business is the most trusted of the four. The third point is trust levels and news sources are at record lows globally and in Japan. 
So the four major sources of information that people have, search engines, traditional media, owned media and social media are all um, in distrusted territory. In addition, uh, we're finding that people don't, they do not believe that they also have credible ways of understanding and assessing information. We call that information hygiene, which is, do you test, do you check the source of information? Do you surround yourself by alternate points of view, alternate news sources? Do you verify the information before you share it? And only one in four globally felt that they had good information hygiene and one in five in Japan. Now for some good news. Uh, we're seeing that my employer is the most trusted institution. In Japan, it's the only trusted institution, which is a really um, big opportunity, but also huge accountability for employers. We're also seeing that employer media is most trustworthy. It's more trusted than news or information from the government and from traditional media. So again, that's a huge accountability, but also opportunity. The final point is related to that business, uh, the opportunity for business. Uh, we see that 60% globally and 53% of respondents in Japan believe that business is central to resolving challenges, societal challenges. And in fact, they are better suited to do so than government. We also see that more than 50% globally and 41% in Japan believe that companies must fill the information void. So where information from government and media and other sources is not credible, they are expecting business to take more of a role in educating and informing the public. And this is my most exciting piece of data. 65% in Japan, a higher percentage even than globally, which is 64%, believe that the pandemic, as horrible as it was, will lead to valuable in innovation that benefits society. So two key findings from the uh, pre-pandemic survey and then now in May, we saw that pre-pandemic customers and clients were the most important stakeholder uh, for a company's long-term success. Post-pandemic, we are seeing that employees are rated as the most important stakeholder. So we did two follow-on surveys, one in consumers and one in employees, which is what I'll walk you through now. So the belief-driven employee, and I have to say this, this data, this survey is most exciting for me because for the past 11 years, I've been focusing a lot on employee engagement, employee experience, and this data does play out what I'm seeing in the workforce. So um, first, I think many of you have been, have been hearing about the great resignation. Um, people during the pandemic, the stress of the pandemic, reflecting on what is important for them. There's a lot of movement in the workforce, people quitting or changing their roles. One in five globally, have quit or have considered quitting in the last six months and one in 10 in Japan. So we wanna find out why, why are they considering leaving? Um, in Japan, the number one driver is better fit for my lifestyle. They want better work-life balance. They want a job with less burnout. They don't wanna to return to the office. Number two is better fit with my values. Something entirely new, a job where they feel valued or is personal fulfilling personally fulfilling. And then of course, still important, always important compensation and career advancement, but it's a far third. I will note that globally, number one is values and number two is lifestyle. So that is uh, slightly flipped. We're also seeing that uh, employees are choosing employers based on beliefs. It's six and 10 globally and four and 10 in Japan. Employees, when they're choosing to choosing a new employer, they look at, does, do they believe in what the company does? Is it, immor is it moral or amoral? Do they agree with their stand on social issues? Is it, does it reflect how they wanna express their opinions? So this belief-driven employer um, is playing out and choosing the next uh, employer for them. The other item that we're seeing when you're considering, considering a job, we ask them what a deal breaker is. What's a strong expectation for choosing that employer? And this is so important in Japan where the talent market is so very tight as it is in many other markets as well, of course. Uh, we're seeing that in Japan, the number one driver is personal empowerment. So that's really how does the company engage and communicate um, and, and empower employees? So regular communication, authentic communication, providing opportunities for employees to provide input, involving employees in the planning process. 
oh, excuse me, I, that is number two. Number one is career advancement, um, is the driving overarching uh, choice. So competitive wages, valuable work experiences. A close uh, number two is personal empowerment. And then social impact, one and two, want to have an opportunity to make a difference in their job. This is an important slide to note. We're seeing that workplace activism is becoming the norm. 76% of global respondents and 60% in Japan noted that they will take action to produce or motivate, urgent, motivate urgently necessary changes within my organization. It is worth noting that in Japan, 45% of the 60% will work within the system. So they will use the channels and platforms and avenues that are available to them within the system and only 23% say they will take it public. The number is far higher globally, as you can see, and we see playing out with a recent Facebook um, incident. We actually asked our data team to look more at what is, what is the demographic of the employees that say that they want to take action in Japan? It's a small data set, so you can't have a, a definitive um, um, answer to this, but they did note the trend of young, uh, employees are more likely to take action and employees of publicly traded um, or multinational companies are more likely to take action than others. We're asking companies to mind the gap and walk the talk on values. So this slide, we, we show the global data next to the Japan data. And then we also show in black the expectations of a company, what they expect from their employer. And then the white is how well they believe their employer is performing. So more than half of respondents in Japan believe that acting on values and the values are reflected in the organization are important. But notably, the gap is very significant in Japan, 29 points for acting on values and 26 for having the values reflected in the organization. So room for improvement. Also, going back to the point about social impact, um, it's important to employees we saw in the previous data I put a mark around purpose because I thought this is an important one for Japan. You'll see that uh, this is the highest expectation of companies, a company that has a greater purpose that they can support. It also had a significant increase, seven points. And while the gap is still large, 17 points, uh, my employers are performing better here than in other categories. So that may be an opportunity to consider. Another point here is on what is sort of the make or break uh, enticements that a company can offer to an employee when they're considering joining um, and staying with a firm. So first and foremost, reliable employment is critical. Second in Japan and globally is diversity, equity, and inclusion, increasingly important. And then the environment as well is number three and expectations or enticements that matter to employees. I'm gonna to just touch briefly on the belief-driven buyer slides. So as with, their, with the employees, we're also seeing an increase in belief-driven buyers. So two and three globally and more than one and two in Japan are increasingly making choices about choosing, switching, avoiding, or even boycotting a brand based on its stand and societal issues. So what a, stand, what a brand does as it relates to important social issues or controversial societal and political issues do matter to consumers these days. We also see that consumers wanna use their brand power to make society better. 78% of respondents globally and 57% in Japan believe that they can force a brand to change its company's social impact. That's quite significant. And in terms of areas where they believe that they can drive change, the number one in Japan is reducing the carbon footprint, followed by labor practices. So I want to just have a summary, you know, that's a lot of data and this is very high level. Um, from the Edelman point of view, we have some very broad um, uh, recommendations uh, for organizations to consider. One is that I think we all recognize culture drives trust. Articulating and living your purpose and values is absolutely critical to your consumers and employees. Employees first, I think most recognize that as well, but it's really now perceived uh, to be most important to consumers and stakeholders outside your company, as well as your own employees. I cannot uh, reinforce more channeling the voice, providing opportunities for your employees to be involved, to be heard and to be part of the solutions. And then finally, make a difference. That, that is 
a strong desire for your employees. It's a strong desire from your stakeholders as well. So with that, those are very top line uh, suggestions. And I want to dive more into what does that specifically mean and talk to the real experts in this space. So we're going to segue into the uh, panel discussion now. We introduced earlier Sakie Fukushima-san, Jin Montesano, and Leo Lewis. Um, and so we're going to now um, dive into that panel discussion and um, ha have a robust one. So let me take down this slide, and then we'll start with the first question. I have to do some. Stopping sharing, there we go. Okay, so now into the panel discussion. Um, the first question that we had is around the, the premise of this, uh, of this panel that we had. Dan and I were talking about, you know, what, what platform do we want to use for the discussion? And that was pre-Olympics. And we were really looking at the impact of the pandemic, wondering what would happen with the Olympics um, and how would Japan brand Japan, which is really government or companies based in Japan, how would they fare um, and what's next for them? So I wanted to start out by asking Leo to share his perspective. You've been covering the issues. You're also covering um, the election now. What, what's your perspective on how has brand Japan fared in the past year and a half? Well, actually, uh, maybe uh, a little to some people's surprise, I, I actually think that Japan, brand Japan has fared reasonably well uh, under the circumstances. I mean, I think if you consider where brand Japan was going into uh, the pandemic, we come off the back of a, a very successful rugby World Cup, which had kind of showcased uh, Japan, I, I would say, at its best in terms of hosting uh, large numbers of uh, foreign visitors. I think that, um, you, you know, from, from the perspective of corporate Japan, uh, there was a sense of progress uh, that was at the time uh, that, that felt like there was there was continuing momentum on, on governance improvements and so on. Um, uh, I, but I would say that uh, the an issue that remained that was that was certainly at play then, and I think remains the case. Sitting where I am uh, at the uh, FT in in Tokyo, um, is is a kind of a, a quest for the relevance of, of brand Japan, uh, and 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 how that comes out in the work that we do. Um, we're writing stories when we are about Japanese companies into a, a marketplace within the FT, uh, where those stories are in competition with, uh, with stories from China, from the rest of Asia, or obviously from the US and, and Europe. And what I think is, is always important for us has been to try to convince editors and, and ultimately readers uh, that the Japanese companies that we're writing about uh, belong in that global conversation and, 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 and that their place is not just uh, deserved, but actually it's, it's vital. And I think that the problem we've had is that that can get forgotten mm. um, by sort of flashier stories end up uh, taking away. And then people find that they're surprised that, you know, Japan is vital to this huge uh, mm -hmm. supply chain that's at issue at the moment and, 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 and so on. So I, I, I would say that uh, in general, the, the, the pandemic has not in any way lessened that as a problem for us. It's, it's convincing convincing the outside world of the of the kind of relevance of of, uh, of Japanese companies and therefore the the vitality I suppose of, of brand mm -hmm. Japan but as a final word I'd say that actually after a, a what seemed like a very bad start um, a slow vaccination program that was actually followed by what's turned out to be a very rapid take up of vaccines in Japan um, and what you can clearly tell from the unpopularity of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of Suga before he resigned as, as, as prime minister is that the general public uh, is very keen for a reopening. Uh, and I think that his, his lack of popularity uh, was a pretty clear reflection of, of that, a pretty pure reflection of that. So the fact that we've now got a new prime minister and a vaccine program that's, that's really now high by global standards, I think is, is probably in the end going to protect brand Japan for a little bit longer. Thanks, Leo. I think the point about 
reinforcing and uh, reminding people of the vitality and relevance of brand Japan uh, now coming out at the, at the back of the uh, Olympics and hopefully post pandemic is so critical. And I'm going to ask Jin to weigh in on that. Um, having seen you experience the Olympic sponsorship, we saw you running with the torch. Um, what's your perspective on how is how J brand Japan has fared um, in the past year and a half? Thank you, Megan. Um, I, I would actually also join Leo. I think J Brand Japan has fared pretty well, um, better than probably most would have said a year ago. Um, mm -hmm. As gold sponsors, uh, you know, we were navigating the same thing Tokog and the Japanese government were navigating. You know, 80% of uh, people protesting the Olympics being hosted. And navigating that was actually pulled off, I think, magnificently. Um, you know, the tone of the 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 whole olympics itself you know walking that really fine line between really celebrating but not too much mm -hmm. right keeping it elegant um but not going overboard but not underplaying it either i mean i think that is a really difficult line to walk you know lixel we've been in transformation to become a much more innovative empowered and inclusive company and we've been doing that since 2016 and when we became gold sponsors, we decided to pivot to make the Olympics much more of an uh, employee participative activity. So rather than really gearing up to spend money on marketing and so forth, we really looked at how are we going to make this something that employees can build more pride over. So we launched a global 250 um, employee volunteers. We were going to host people from all around the world who, who we would bring in and have a group of global volunteers in Japan. Uh, we did a lot of campaigns and programs. Lixel actually has an Olympian, a Paralympian named Osamu uh, Nagashima, whom we were very proud. He actually placed fifth. Uh, so he didn't medal this year, but we, we consider him a tremendous winner. And we really leveraged his story internally to help everyone understand what the meaning and the purpose is behind Paralympics and para sports in general. So we really, I think, maximized the Olympic event uh, as something we could be proud about internally. And though we ultimately couldn't bring all our global uh, volunteers to Japan because of all the reasons we know, um, we did host lots of virtual activities and and created um, you know really cool swag <laughs> and sent it out and we had like virtual Olympic events internally and things like that. You know I think Brand Japan, in terms of Lixel, is more relevant than ever. Um, we we used we just had a global town hall yesterday and Kenya rocked up in you know burgundy jeans and a and a pair of red sneakers. I mean this was this is new Lixel, okay yeah. and. One of the really cool things, um, you know, about Brand Japan is just that we decided to be so decisive in really putting people first when COVID happened in 2020, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we took for we we took immediate decision to move towards special allowances to get everybody into work from home. Kenya and I had been working on work from home for so long, but it was hard to shift that needle. So yesterday's town hall was called The Future Is Now. Mm -hmm. And the reason we use that theme is because it would have taken us five years to get to remote working, but we got there in a month and a half. Because by the time we announced it in February 2020, by March, we were already at 5% clocking into the headquarter office and roughly 6,000 people call headquarters site in Ojima uh, their, their kind of work site. OK, so and we've been able to manage a single digit percentage because we we see the call, the security card buzzing in and out. We've been able to manage that right through until this day. So, yeah. yeah. But if you look at our financial performance, you know, we're more productive and more efficient than ever. So through the course of really working with employees, managers and leaders to demonstrate our own resilience, the resilience perhaps we didn't know we had. I think we're able to overcome some of these myths we had about needing to kind of see the person sitting there in order to know they're getting their work done. Yeah, and yeah. we use this as an opportunity also to completely shift to flexible working. You know, employees in Japan now work where they want, when they want, and where and how they want. So we've really gone to extreme uh, full flex adding super flex, there's no official work hours and things oh, like yeah. that. We've got a whole bunch of HR policies we've done. 
So that actually created a sense of security and stability for global employees as well, where they feel like Brand Japan is the stable, um, decisive kind of um, organization that, that's creating this overall umbrella for all of Lixel. And before this happened, you know, I would say our overseas colleagues weren't really quite sure how to think about uh, being part of a Japan-based uh, corporation. And so I think today there really are a lot the, um, This was really, again, going back to the innovation that's possible because of the pandemic, that this drove that significant change that allowed really uh, you to seize on uh, initiatives that you already had in play or to pivot and also perhaps the permission to take some really strong decisions or actions, um, which is great to see play out and in, in the, the really progressive policies that you have in, in place. So kind of a, a build on that, the opportunity or, you know, how, um, you know, in the end, it was touch and go, it felt before the Olympics. And I think a lot of companies were really trying to figure out how to navigate the new remote working. But now, you know, we're on the other side of it. We're seeing this increasingly belief-driven landscape, right? Employees want more. They want to know that their work matters. Um, consumers want more. So I, I you know, I, we think a lot about what does that mean for brand Japan, companies based in Japan? And specifically, you know, are there innate strengths that they have that perhaps are not being understood or communicated or not or leveraged enough? And what are the uh, unique challenges that they face? I, I think a lot about what does diversity and inclusion mean for a company based in Japan? Um, so I'd like to hear um, from Sakie san on the first point about, you know, what, what are some of those innate strengths or unique challenges? And Sakie san with your experience on multiple boards, both in Japan and, and globally, what is your view on that? Well, <clears throat> I, well, I appreciate Jin's comment. I was quite surprised that Lixu was able to respond so quickly to this disastrous situation. Jap Japanese companies usually need certain types of uh, crisis or push or gaiatsu to change drastically. So I was a bit surprised. But um, I think regarding your questions about the board experience, mm -hmm. um, I think there is a diverse difference between the US and the American board. So let me just briefly explain my experience, experience about the board. So this may go into the second question. Would you like me to hold my comments until the second question? Or? No, go ahead and, and <laughs> jump in. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, first, I, since I have throat allergy, I may <clears throat> start coughing in the middle of my comments, but please don't worry, it's not serious. So let me briefly explain my board experience so that you can better understand my perspective. My corporate governance experience began in 1995 when I was elected to the board of directors of Confrey, then the largest American <laughs> executive search firm. I ended up serving on the board for 12 years, guiding the firm to transition from a partnership to a corporation. After Conferi went public in 1999, I ended up remaining as the only internal board member other than the CEO. Since 2002, I have served as an outside member of the board of directors for 12 major Japanese companies, including Kao, Sony, Mitsubishi Corporation, Register, Najinomoto, Konika Minota, and so on. <laughs> Since 1995, I have attended 68 annual general meetings of shareholders of 13 firms oh <laughs> and have experienced firsthand the evolution of corporate governance in Japan and the US over the past 26 years. When I started serving on the board of Japanese companies 20 years ago, after having served on the board of American listed company, I was struck by the differences in corporate governance between the US and Japan. The American and Japanese systems used to be two extremes regarding the mission of the CEO. In the US, I think Jim may know well, the first thing you learned at business schools was that the CEO's mission is to maximize shareholders' profit. By contrast, CEO of traditional Japanese companies were expected to focus on stakeholders in general, including employees, customers, partners, and suppliers. I have often witnessed these differences during board discussions, in particular on such issues as divestiture. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Recently, you have seen some convergence. Japan moving to the American system, valuing shareholders, and the U.S. paying more attention to stakeholders by introducing SDGs and ESG criteria, as exemplified by the famous August 2019 Business Roundtable <clears throat> statement. Right. Japan has traditionally valued sampo yoshi, good for customers, sellers, and society. This is similar to SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. So although SDGs as a corporate, as a concept has been introduced by the West, Japanese companies have actually been practicing SDGs by emphasizing the importance right. of employees, customers, partners, and society. Recent changes in corporate, Japanese corporate governance, including introduction of corporate governance code in 2015, and a new governance structure such as the nomination and audit committee system have been in response to pressures by foreign investors who focus on the interests of stake shareholders. The Japanese companies have benefited from these outside pressures mm -hmm. and they improved their governance. I'm not saying which system is better. I believe that the process of reviewing and exploring the company's governance to identify the best way to increase corporate value is valuable to know thyself. This is no, there is no one size fits all in corporate governance. Thank you. Thank you, Sakye san. Yeah, when we discussed, you know, know thyself is a great way to summarize that. But also, you noted that you felt that the stance towards governance and uh, stakeholder capitalism is converging now. So it is really a new expectation for global companies. Um, so mm -hmm. that's that's a, it's a great point. It's one that I discussed with Jean as well. So Jean, I wanted to know if you had some additions on your perspective on unique strengths of uh, Japanese-based organizations or unique challenges, especially from the ESG perspective. Well, I think it goes back to um, the broader, the final slide you presented really uh, related to the belief driven landscape that we f we see it for ourselves and the belief driven employee. You know, um, Lixels might be a particularly unique case, I don't know. Um, but if I look at Japan, you know, brand Japan through the lens of, of Lixel, you know, we had been in transformation for a number of years. And um, actually, um, we started um, building a sustainability and corporate relate uh, corporate responsibility strategy as far back as 2016 and really integrating that into our overall corporate strategy. Um, and then only recently, you know, we started to get recognized as a company that was doing some of the right things with regard to environment and social. As you know, we have this award winning uh, social business called Sato that makes, you know, five dollar toilets for the one point three billion people on the planet who practice open defecation because of a lack of sanitation systems. And um, as a result of this activity, uh, we realized how much that was actually generating climate survey results. You know, employees when asked, what right. are you proud to work for Lixel, right. you know, that kept coming up. So we, we continue to expand and just organically keep doing what we're already doing. I think this year in 2021, we published an integrated report, which we do every year for um, investors, shareholders, as well as our broader stakeholders. And I think it's probably the most um, coherently articulated uh, report we've ever published and really kind of showing how much our corporate strategy is defined by the commitments we're making to social environmental and of course governance given our rather unique and boisterous past recent past which leo knows all too well um and so i think that's a really important point for us that you know to me the the belief driven landscape is a tremendous tailwind for lixel and it is going to enable us to become even more competitive and more uniquely differentiated we think than our other Japanese company peers. And that's because Japan still is cool. And to all of our oh. colleagues outside of Japan, people love Japan and know things about Japan that are far more positive than negative. And we have figured out how to become much sharper about really bringing the best of Japan into the broader global conversation within Lixel. Uh, in the past, I don't think we were as strongly signaling to employees overseas about what they can think about Lixel 
and as a Japan based organization, what we believe, what we um, see as our direction going forward, um, how we play the long game. You know, um, a great example would be how Kenya always talks about, you know, Western companies seeking best talent, best talent. But um, if you play a longer game about talent management and people development, you don't always need to have the best talent for every role. You can actually take someone who's not ready yet, stretch them and have the patience to really kind of bring them along. So, you know, these are all very unique and different ways to think about the world. And I think Brand Japan for Lixel has become much more relevant, much more interesting, and there's more permission to really enjoy it and look into it. And I think that's an exciting part of what's going on with us. It's great to hear the communications that you're taking, as you noted, this, <clears throat> this massive integrated report that you're able to, you know, to, to produce, to show, to tell the story of what you're doing. And I, I want to come back to the, the long-term talent strategies in our next question. But you know, I think there is something about one, um, Saki san noted, really Sampo Yoshi, this deep rooted commitment that has been there that is so part of the values. And then your point about really realizing how much a program that you had been doing just to do it because it's good and you started to communicate it and it really made such an impact to your employees. So Leo, I'd like your opinion on, you're looking at Japan brand from the outside. You're also hearing the perspectives of, of your readers. So, you know, any additional points yeah. on unique yeah. strengths or challenges? Well, I mean, both uh, Jin and, and Saki have, have made points that, I mean, I would say there are, there are counterpoints to them, uh, which, which I like are, a counterpoint. Which, are, which I would say is as follows. So, so taking Jin's, Jin, Jin, what Jin was saying about, about how Lixil adapted very quickly to the, uh, to, to, to the pandemic or with uh, home working and, uh, and so on. Look, I, I'm 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 very glad that Jin was able and and uh, Seto Sam were, were able to manage that relationship with their with their employees well and 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 it, that's great for for Lixil. I think more broadly, uh, there is uh, you know that uh, you know for for a country where companies have been hiding behind this uh, this claim that they. Uh, value stakeholders equally, and that the, and that their employees are, are one set of those stakeholders. Why does it take a pandemic to accelerate <laughs> a change that literally millions of employees were begging for? Everyone in Japan yeah. wanted greater flexibility yeah. of working. I Why agree. does it take that long? Yeah. And 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 to, to to take this sorry to to be serious about this in terms of what the what we see as the as the FT, we talk to investors who want to understand corporate Japan, and. And one of the, the paradoxes is that we, 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 that they are, investors are constantly told, ah, you know, the reason that it's different is because we treat stakeholders differently than you do in the West. We, 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 we mm. equate these stakeholders with shareholders, and therefore mm. we've got a different system. That's fine, but we need more evidence that you actually are valuing the, the, all the stakeholders equally, because why, why have you not listened evidence. for so long Mm -hmm. um, to, to employees who say, we need greater flexibility, particularly women employees of a large number of companies right. that would have loved to see this kind of flexibility introduced decades ago. My, my second point, again, is, is to, to, thank, to what Sakia says, again, which, which relates to this, which is that it does very much look like it's foreign uh, investors uh, who have been uh, making these the, let's say applying these pressures on Japanese companies to focus more on their shareholders, and that the the sort of resistance from within corporate Japan uh, has been to that foreign pressure. I don't deny that's the case. What I think is more interesting and has been more interesting for me is the question of why a country where twenty five percent of the country are retirees, it isn't domestic pressure that hasn't forced that. Mm. Uh, kind of kind of change. You, you guys in Japan are the pensioners, are, are, are either current pensioners or soon to be pensioners. The question of how much money, uh, uh, you know, how much money Japanese companies should be returning to shareholders, is a great deal more relevant to people in Japan than it is to people outside Japan. Uh, and so, so again, to bring this back to brand Japan, the, the question for us has always been. Um, why, you know, how to understand those paradoxes, really, um, and, and why, um, 
you know, why companies say one thing and appear to do another. And, and all the evidence, the strongest evidence we have is, is how they treat their shareholders. We don't right. know what goes on inside the company, um, how they deal with other stakeholders, but we do know how they deal with their shareholders because that's a matter of public and you very visible that. record. Right. And I so, mean, you know, that's what we have to, to work with. And okay. so we, you know. Yeah, I think that, you know, why didn't it happen earlier is, you know, a question that, uh, you know, in the United States, um, Edelman was not a remote workforce, and it only happened because of this uh, event that forced it, and people thought it was going to be so much more complicated, or it was complicated, but it happened anyway. So again, that's one of the innovations that happened because of the pandemic, even though the pandemic has been so hard. Um, so I want to do one more question, and then we'll go to questions from folks. And so if you have if you have questions in the audience, please type them in the chat. Um, we, we'd love to shift to those. We'll have about uh, seven minutes for questions. So my, my one other question that I wanna get to is really on the employee um, aspect, right? So a lot of our data is about these new higher expectations of employees. We know, uh, Jin, to your point about, you know, the best workforce, well, maybe, you know, the, 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 the most talented um, person, you need the best of the best for a role. And you talked about longer term strategies for talent um, attraction and retention. So it seems to me, and I'm, I'm seeing this play out, there's a new compact um, that is developing between employer and employee. And I think that's particularly um, a big shift in, in Japan, right? So the traditional expectations of what the employer provided and what the employee expected are, are changing. So I'd like to just hear a little bit about that. Um, Sakie-san, we, we discussed a bit about your, you know, you've been working in the talent field for many, many years. You've seen the shift. You are one of the earliest recruiters. You know, what are you seeing in terms of what companies need to consider now as it relates to the, the workforce, engaging the workforce and the new expectations for, from employees to employers? Jin first. Oh, Jin, do you want to? Yeah, okay, so okay. you go ahead first. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I think uh thank you. <clears throat> In Japan, the relationship between employees, employers and employees, as you mentioned, used to be paternalistic, with the employer considering employees as family members so that the company will take care of their employees <clears throat> for life, the so-called lifetime employment system. Therefore, changing companies was not seen favorably as a result. When I joined Conferry 30 years ago, the so-called headhunting business was viewed with suspicion in Japan, like <clears throat> an industry spy. Since then, the world has changed so that even the prime minister is advocating labor market mobility. Mm -hmm. During the so-called lost decade of 2000, major Japanese companies no longer held on to all their employees, and they started to introduce early retirement packages. Even then, I had a huge argument on an NHK TV program with Mr. Sekimoto, then chairman of NEC, who disagreed with me when I said that Japanese companies were not genuinely gentle, yasashi, mm. to their employees because the companies actually prevented them from being marketable by not training them with skills that were useful outside their companies. By that time, I was keenly aware that there was a shortage of Japanese executives who could be successful professionally, excuse me, successful professionals <clears throat> in global organizations. One of the most important requirements lacking among many Japanese executives is the ability to manage diversity and crisis, including natural disasters and pandemics. That's why I was very happy to hear Jin's comment. So over the past 25 years, I have published several books on how to develop global professional executives. In this connection, when I chaired the Employment and Labor Market Committee of Kezai Do Yukai in 2016, our committee issued a report on how the new industrial revolution introduced by AIIOT would change people's attitudes toward work and their organizations. Our proposal was that Japanese companies need to <clears throat> change their way of working to accommodate diversity in the labor force by introducing flexibility in work style using AIIOT and create a more mobile labor market that could offer <clears throat> diverse work style, including independent freelance workers with professional expertise. We produced nine, 
we produce nine new working styles on the matrix with the vertical axis representing a level of expertise and the horizontal axis representing a level of relationship with an organization. The top three categories have the three types of professionals, including in-house professional, multi-employment professional, and the independent professional. We assumed that the independent professional who work outside of the company on a contract basis as freelance, <coughs> freelancers is likely increase given these right. rapid changes in the labor market. Employees also need to develop themselves to be professionals with marketable expertise. For the last three years, I have been telling Japanese employees that they should not expect their companies to take care of their career. They need to take ownership of their own career plan and form their <coughs> career strategy early on. Younger people now understand that they need to be self-reliant. Right. Thank you. Yes, we discussed that. And mm -hmm. Jin, I would like you just to add on to that. We talked about, you know, again, this change and employees, you know, Sakie san's recommendation that employees need to really drive their career and own it. Um, and you had a, an additional point on that to, to suggest or offer. So I'd like to hear that. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, we one of the first things I did when I took on this job was formulate a, an, a, an entire campaign to explain to uh, employees, we call it my career journey, but to implain, uh, explain that employees need to actually get into the driver's seat of their careers. You know, heads up, we're, we're departing from seniority system, that's gonna be gone. We're moving to the performance management system, what does it mean? You yeah. know, when Leo asked those questions, the counterpoints about well, why did it take so long? Well, the answer is actually quite the answer is not rocket science, Leo, but it's super complicated by seniority based system, age based system, yeah. just complete, you know, inability to move, you know, shifting culture requires hardware and software. You know, we have the hardware in terms of HR policies. All you have to do is change those policies, right? Give people more maternity and paternity. But you know what? Nobody takes it. Why? Because right. everyone's looking to the right, looking to the left. And if they're not doing it, I'm not going to do it. Shifting culture, that's the software. That requires huge amounts of communication, executive engagement, you know, really going out there, showing yourself, talking about why it might have been hard for you, but why you got it now, really getting every single Oji san on board. That is the only way. It is a hard way, but it's the only way. We started to do that activity because everybody else was on Zoom. It was kind of easy to get to everyone. And that worked, you know, and and we're, we've got lots to go, so don't get me wrong. I mean, we, we, we haven't actually achieved Nirvana yet, but I'll tell you one thing. We just wrapped up a big EVP study with an external firm, and they talked to hundreds of new joiners to Lixel. The, uh, the category was under two years, you know, people who joined Lixel in Japan, okay, under two years. And the number one reason they gave why they joined, work-life balance. Right. That's now, how many Japanese story. companies are going to be able to right. say, yeah. I joined this company for work life balance, <laughs> you know, and and Kenya was really excited to hear that because that's what we've been working we've been on. on. Yeah, yeah, we're using, yeah. as he put it to Leo, actually, you know, yeah. this is a blessing in disguise as horrible as the pandemic is. So let's make hay while the sun shines and, and turn this thing into something we can really use. Yeah to make competitive advantage. And as far as he's concerned, all the miserable people who are in, um, who are very talented in Japan in these inflexible work environments, you know, if they want to go to another Japanese companies with strong purpose-driven culture with full flexibility, I mean, I got guys moving to Kamakura and Chiba because yep. we've released yep. the location requirement to your head, your office site. You know, we're doing all sorts of things to empower employees. So. The fact that that data came back to us that way really confirmed that we were on the right track because that's what we wanted. We want to track these talented Japanese who want to keep working, but they want to actually have a life. You know, we think that's possible. Yeah, and it's great to see that happening, and we are seeing more companies do that. And your point about uh, really getting every employee on board so that um, change is individual, but also you do have a leader who has that vision and is driving yeah. it. And sure. it's going to be bottoms up and, and top down, right? So you need both to, to drive that. We are at six minutes left. So I want to um, shift to questions for the panel. Um, Dan, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you take the lead here. Um, questions for our esteemed panelists here about what we talked about or the data that we shared. 
Yeah, we have a couple of questions in the uh, chat box, but just before we go to that, let me let me just ask one very simple question, and just maybe Leo and Jin, may, maybe uh, you could just answer with a very quick answer. We've heard about all of these positive things about Japan, and we've heard the counterpoint that yes, but that's not really getting through, or is it real? Most of the people on this call are communicators. What can Japanese companies do better to communicate the good things and to understand how they need to change the bad things? Maybe Leo, you as an outsider well, and not a corporate sure. communications professional would be able no, to... No, sh sure. Well, I look, you, I think you already guessed what the question, what the answer is going to be, which is that it's, tra it's, it's transparency. Ultimately, the, the, the governance, you know, the, the, the governance progress that was made, the, the, the greatest uh, progress was probably, in my view, made on, on transparency. Uh, and uh, you know, coming back to, to, to you know Megan's the, the, the find the Edelman findings at the beginning. I mean, if it's if, it, if it's about trust, uh, then transparency is at least uh, at least one guarantee uh, of of uh, of that. And uh, and so you know, we, we're sorry, I don't want to go on too long, but it, it's it. I, I would say that the that where governance has uh, where governance improvement has, has created greater transparency, particularly, again, going to what Sakia said, on the boards of companies, the idea that boards are acting uh, for the shareholders particularly and, and that they are themselves transparent uh, institutions. That's, I think, the, that, that's, I think what, what needs to be projected uh, most strongly. Yeah. And I think the cousin of transparency is really open and honest dialogue. Um, you know, we've really adopted real talk um, and sometimes the conversations are kind of tough and we're really working. Um, I mean, Kenya does take the lead and that helps, right? The number one most important driver is to have senior level commitment walking the talk. But, you know, we, we try to avoid the communicator script as much as possible. We use workplace as a platform internally. So we can't script everybody, you know? So leaders are kind of on their own and we give them a lot of guidelines um, to be honest and direct. You know, uh, you know, you don't have to think of honest and direct as offensive. You don't have to be rude, right? But we we don't anymore. Uh, we, we encourage people not to do the messaging internally, to really kind of talk about what's going on. And if you've had a really bad day and it was hard for you, you should talk about that. And I think this language has created a space, you know, for people to feel like it's okay to not be okay, even if you're a leader or a manager and to talk about that. And that's actually been working much better outside of Japan, but it's really moving in Japan mm -hmm. as well. So transparency, also authentic communication. It all comes back to communications, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> not all of it. Dan, Great. Go ahead. Um, so in terms of a question from the audience, um, so this is about how the Japanese perspective can help, uh, you know, solve some global issues. And, you know, what, what global topics do you think the Japanese perspective is, it will be really essential for? Is it governance, supply chain? Is it climate change? Like, is it China? <laughs> I mean, like, what, what are some of the areas that you think that Japan should start speaking up more on? and uh, becoming more engaged in global conversations about. That's for Leo, right? It, it oh, was sorry. originally, yeah, originally well, for Leo, I mean, anyone yeah, can so jump look, in. Yeah. So look, I, look I, I, don't, I think that the, the Japanese expertise in managing supply chains is, is second to none. It's almost been forgotten because it's so good. Uh, it's historically very, very good indeed. And Japan's existence as an island nation uh, that's might be managing low resources, low natural resources on its own shores and so on for such a long time, um, has given it an expertise that the world is suddenly realizing uh, it needs uh, and needs, you know, in spades. And so I, I, um, I, I think that the Japanese management of supply chains is, is, is more relevant than it's ever been uh, at this point. And I mean, that's one of the things that we're going to be focusing on over the coming sort of six months at the, at the FT here in in, in, in Tokyo and Asia more broadly, actually. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, I think we're um, nearly out of time. So I'll hand it back to you, Megan, to close. Great, well, um, thank you all for 
dialing in, making time in your busy day. Uh, a huge thank you to our panelists, to Sakie-san, to Jean-san, and to Leo-san. I'll add San to all of your names, to be fair here, um, and for the discussion. Um, I think we all on the call are very passionate about the future of Japan. We are all um, really rooting for Japan brand to show up and, and to show so many of their strengths on the world stage. So it was heartening to see that we're hopefully on the other side of the pandemic. I hope that our trust data are, um, can serve as a roadmap to organizations or to help convince leaders, your leaders, to consider change, to take bold change. And I hope that some of the examples shared today by our panelists uh, on what works and some areas to consider for additional learning um, are helpful to those on the call um, today. So thank you all for joining. Uh, we're honored that you were able to be part of this. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks very much. Thanks, Thank all. You.